the behind the scenes. All right, so again, thank you so much for attending today's session, Neighbors Know Best, Building Citizen Philanthropy. This session is being put on by the Black Empowerment Works Program of United Way of Greater Cincinnati. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is Black Empowerment Works to start and welcome you on behalf of our entire Black Empowerment Works team. So that consists of myself, Janae Bradley, Jeremiah Pennebaker, and Anaya Arnold. So about Black Empowerment Works. So Black Empowerment Works promotes Black self-determination, social mobility, and economic prosperity by resourcing and funding community-based grassroots Black-led work. So we go beyond just providing a grant to say what other connections and supports can we provide so that we can, one, advance the well-being of Black people in greater Cincinnati, and two, invest in promising work that often goes unfunded or underfunded, or work that's left out of traditional grant processes. We're entering into our third cycle of this program where we invite folks to apply for grant funding as well as serving as a community reviewer or the person or group of people that make the decisions on who gets funded and what work gets funded. I wanna quickly go over some important process dates within the Black Empowerment Works program. So applications are now live for both the grant and reviewer opportunities. We'll be closing that reviewer application on June 8th and begin training of those reviewers on June 20th. July 1st at 5 p.m. is when the grant application closes. So be sure if you're applying to be a grantee that you get those in by that deadline. The reviewers will then work to read the written application submitted between the 1st and the 1st of August, and we'll hold those conversations with grant applicants and reviewers from August 1st through 12th. We'll be ready to make those individual or communicate those individual investment decisions on August 24th for the public decisions to go out on August 29th. So we are just a little bit above 100 days out from the public announcement of the grants. What we felt was important as we were leading up to the application process was to create space for other community resource organizations to share a bit about the work that they do, resources that will likely be helpful to you in your work as a change maker or as someone that supports change makers. So that's why we have today's session taking place. But if you want to connect with the Black Empowerment Works team outside of that, we have lots of resources available to you, including visiting our website, uwgc.org slash BEW apply. You can give us a call at the phone number listed here. It rings to all three of the team members' phones. So someone will answer you. And if not, we'll get back to you within 24 hours. And right now, we're trending at within four hours, or you can send us an email at black-led at uwgc.org. But you didn't come here for me to say all of this. You came to hear about the topic of the day, Neighbors Know Best, Building Citizen Philanthropy. With us, we have Leslie Maddie Rich of IOBE, and she'll be talking about the deep roots and grassroots work that they're helping to support through the IOB platform. So thank you for joining us here today, Leslie. Thanks so much, Janae. Um, I am excited to be here and um, share a little bit with you about uh, what we do at IOB, the impact that we've had, and answer any questions that you might have about crowd resourcing and the fiscal sponsorship services that we provide. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen. There we go. All right. So first off, you may, you hear I work for IOB. That's not an actual word. It is a mnemonic that stands for in our backyards. It's the opposite of NIMBY, not in my backyard. And um, we exist really to walk with deep roots, mud roots, grassroots leaders to create community and neighbor power change. And so we, ha we have a crowdfunding platform similar to Kickstarter or GoFundMe. But what makes us different is that we, people like me, who have uh, built connections and uh, really love their city uh, are connecting with 
neighborhood leaders like you to untangle um, and give power back to neighbors in terms of getting them the money they need to get their ideas to happen. Um, and so um, we're doing that just in the same way that a lot of the grassroots campaigns that we've seen in the last few years through small donations. Um, a lot of folks, especially in a city like Cincinnati that has such a strong, um, so many strong philanthropic organizations, sometimes we forget the power of our neighbors. And so that's what we're really focusing on is those small gifts that make a big impact. And we are taking a lot of those old school community organizing skills that probably a lot of you already know and attaching them to technology because we know that people don't like writing checks. Lots of people don't carry cash, but they will you know, give an online gift. They'll send you money through Cash App or Venmo or PayPal. And so we're just really connecting those tools. So anyone can work with IOB. Um, you don't have to be attached to a nonprofit. You don't have to be, um, you know, something official. We really believe that neighbors know best. And so that's why we have um, really opened that up to people. Um, and the other requirement is that whatever your idea is, it's got to be local to you. So you cannot say, hey, I'm, I want to raise money for multiple sclerosis, or I want to raise money for the free store food bank. It has to be a project that happens somewhere where you live and work that you care about, and that it also has a public or community benefit. And so it um, can't necessarily be something where it's just of a personal benefit. Um, so things like that could be a community garden, it could be a mural, um, it could be, um, we have a project right now that is a um, social enterprise food truck where they're going to, some days of the week, they're gonna offer food in food insecure neighborhoods um, at a pay what you can model and other days they'll be out at events selling at market rate to kind of fund those other parts of their food truck. So um, we, I really, my job is to work with you to make your project eligible, um, but sometimes we may not be the platform for you. All right, so um, why would you want a crowdfund? Um, we know a lot of times when you are receiving a grant, um, a lot of times those funds are restricted. They're related to a particular project. They're related to a particular um, focus area. So with crowdfunding, you're able to, again, lean into like, I'm the expert in my neighborhood and I know what my neighborhood needs. So you can get that flexible, unrestricted money funding. Um, we also, you know, taking those old school skills of community engagement, um, we're helping you get your neighbors excited, get them connected, um, help them support your work. Um, it's also helping you get specific, you know, what is it that you care about? What is this project going to do? We're helping and coaching you in that. Um, also, um, in times where you are applying for a grant, doing a crowdfunding campaign with IOB can help you demonstrate that public support that you have because you're able to access your donor list and say, I had 75 people donate to my campaign for phase one of this work. And with the grant that you're going to award me, I'll be able to continue with phase two. Um, and it's a really great way to tool test things. Maybe you've got an idea, you don't know if it's gonna work. Um, and because those newer ideas, we all know sometimes are harder to get funding. And so by partnering with IOB, you can get that seed money to test an idea that you have. Um, how do I have that slice? Okay, and then this just shows us, shows you where we work and I lead, and our Cincinnati office is not on there, that's funny. Um, but Cincinnati opened during the pandemic. And since that time, we have, we're almost at the $300,000 mark that we have helped neighbors raise here in Cincinnati. And IOB Nationwide has helped neighbors raise $16 million for their projects. So um, before we go into some of the skills that we work with you all on, I just wanna cover some crowdfunding myths. Um, a lot of times people think, well, I'm gonna put up this page online and then money is just gonna come in. And we all know that um, it's just not gonna happen that way. 
um, people need to be engaged. They need to care about your story um, or they're giving because they care about you. Um, the second is that social media is gonna help fundraise for you. Um, our data shows that um, half of 1% of your friends on social media are going to donate to a campaign because the algorithm changes all the time. Most of your friends aren't seeing your posts. It's great for building awareness about your work, but it's not necessarily great for getting people to actually donate money to support your work. Um, crowdfunding might annoy your family and friends. Not true at all. It makes it easy for your friends to donate. Um, and it's also a way for you to update your friends and family about the work that you're doing. We have an update section on our pages that people can just go to in their own time to check all of that out. And most of the time, your friends and your family care about you. So they're going to care about the work that you're doing. And the crowdfunding and IOB.org is just another tool in your toolbox to bring those ideas to life. Um, you have to have a great project to interest donors. Not at all true. Um, I, um, we've had things at, like community yoga, free little libraries, um, uh, street parties to reunite neighbors after being separated from COVID. It is really whatever you believe your community needs, that is a project that matters. And your storytelling, which is one of the things that we work with people who partner with us on, is really what's gonna get people to care about your work, see why it's important. Um, and a lot of times it's those small projects that then lead to the big things um, or just help you grow and build momentum in your community. So um, another thing um, is that when you get ready to talk about money, we work with you to build a team. You shouldn't be doing this by yourself um, because you're also managing whatever the project it is that you're working on in all likelihood. So bring, and not everyone can be good at everything. So you may have people that are amazing at um, visual storytelling. You may have people who are really great at telling their story in one-on-ones over coffee. Um, you've got people who have time to, to write emails, to thank donors, build those people in your campaign, find the skills that you don't have, and then find the people that have them, and you'll be able to fundraise six times faster, and you'll be more likely to reach your goal. Um, and so these are just some of the key people to look for in your team when you're talking about money. Um, the person that's really good at reminding people, um, people get busy. You can't just ask, there, there are those unicorns that you ask once and they're going to, to give to you. Um, but a lot of people need reminders. Life happens, um, you know, things pull us away. And so sometimes people intend to donate and they just are pulled in another direction. And once we're nudging them back, they'll donate. Um, you might need a person who's going to be the person that talks to me all the time. Not everybody on your team has to interact with me, but it might be the person that is, is doing that work, building the page, doing those things. And then that manager who's kind of keeping all those pieces going, looking at, um, who's doing what and when, when they're doing it by and keeping the timeline moving along. Um, here's the other thing we have been told that it is not polite to talk about money. And the reason that we've been told that is that because the people who have money want to keep that money. And part of the reason that I work at IOB is that I really believe that this is liberation work because we are getting people to talk about money, to get neighbors to invest into the community to improve their own community and to build that ownership, to build um, community assets, to build um, community pride. And for the people who live in the neighborhood and know what it needs the best, but also believe in it and see it's the assets and the giftedness of the people, 
to invest in it. And so um, don't be afraid to ask for a specific amount of money. And part of that, um, we'll go more into why in that. Um, and this is not gonna, this shouldn't take a lot of time. If your whole team gives two hours per week for six to 10 weeks, you're gonna knock it out of the park. Um, you can also, um, from time to time, IOB has their own matches. Right now we do have a matching grant where if you are doing a project related to COVID recovery or reconnecting neighbors who have been separated as a result of COVID, um, then the first $2,000 that you raise gets matched dollar for dollar. But you all may have supporters in your networks that could offer a match. And that can make um, smaller donors dollars go faster. And it also makes people just feel like their gift is more significant. I know that every time that NPR pl pledge drive comes on, it's the three for one match. That's always the time that I give because what, I, what I'm gonna give is three times bigger. Um, a lot of people host events. Um, the groups from Action Tank, they're really good at this, hosting events where um, they did like a coffee and um, wine night. Um, they also did a really cool virtual event where they did um, a trivia night um, on Zoom just like this and then had people um, donate to their IOWiki campaign at the end. Um, and then you also can, you know, get um, other people on board to kind of be your advocates out in the community and talk about what you're doing. Um, and this is just a little bit about kind of the skills to look for when you're thinking about building your team. Um, and just a little bit about like the celebrity that's like, I call like the neighborhood grandma that everybody knows, like the kids are on their porch, everybody knows that Ms. Jackson is the person to talk to, that's your community celebrity, because if they're on board, then everybody else in your neighborhood is going to be on board. Um, we also provide support in like just those project management pieces. Um, not everybody is um, loves budgeting as much as I do. I love it so much. Um, it, nothing brings me more joy than talking to people doing community work who are freaked out by thinking about a budget and walking away and they have it totally figured out um, because I've walked with them and just gotten what's in their head into an organized fashion. Because in the most cases, it's all there. You just need that roadmap. And so that's part of what I do. Um, we also, um, a lot of times we'll work with people in any size budget. Um, sometimes if people have like big budgets, we kind of help them chunk it out uh, because that will help you just be, see success quicker and get those funds to you a little bit quicker. Um, and this is just a quote uh, from one of our IOB leaders, Danny. Um, and he said, you know, we didn't want to wait for that big magical grant. We wanted to roll up our sleeves and get to it. And IOB allowed us to do that, to jump in and to get started. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, grant applications have, um, you know, application windows. And then you hear about it like a week before the grants do. And you have like your everyday life happening. Um, or um, you just aren't in a place yet where you're ready to do that. You know, you're an individual. You don't have a 501c3. You have no interest in doing a 501c3. Or you're getting a grant that requires you to bring um, matching dollars to the table. And that, that's a really great way to partner with IOB too, where if it's a $5,000 grant and you have to bring another 5,000 to the table, we can work and support with you um, on that. And this is just an example of one of those small projects that makes a big impact. Um, this is Sarah Newstock and she raised $543 because she was tired of cars near the street that she walked to school on, zipping past and not paying attention to people that were in crosswalks. So she was able to um, use the money that she raised to uh, get about 45 flags at this major intersection so that everybody that crosses the street is more visible and more safe. And that was something she was passionate about, she cared about, and she knew her neighborhood needed. 
and it took less than a thousand dollars to make it happen. <coughs> the other thing that we'll do with folks is that we work with you on telling a story, keeping it personal, focusing that story. Um, you know, sometimes we can all meander, but keeping it focused, keeping it tight, getting people to understand why your work matters in the bigger picture. Um, it's also part of my work. I'm gonna take a drink. Um, <coughs> to remind you that you are an expert. You are an expert in the thing you are passionate about. You are an expert in your community and speak as an expert. Um, and you know, bring a little bit of dra dramatic flair, a little humor that helps bring people into the story. And so that's part of what I do as well is getting you comfortable with that storytelling. If that's not a tool that you have already um, worked into your toolbox, I can help you with that. Um, and I also um, just really recommend anytime that you, if you haven't been talking to people about your work already, take some time and write it down and think about who is, who are the potential audience people that I'm going to be talking to and what matters to them. Put yourself in their shoes. Why would they care about the work that you're doing and why it's important? And when you're able to make that connection, those folks are going to be more likely to support your work, either through a monetary donation or as a volunteer or as an advocate in the larger community for your work so that it gets the attention and the support that it deserves. Um, I always recommend that you start with friends and family because they care about you, they love you, and they're going to give you honest feedback about the work that you're doing. And it's a really um, generous way um, to step into something that might not be comfortable for you because they'll be able to say, you know, the part where you talked about the work that you were doing was really great, but you never asked me for a specific amount of money. And so when you present to your friends and family, getting that feedback from them is only gonna help make you better. And thinking about the why. Why is your project important and necessary? Why, that is the heart of your story. That is the thing that when you talk to other people about it, it's the thing that gets you excited. It is the thing that once makes you want to jump out of bed in the morning. It is the thing that when you picture this project happening, that makes you proud. Um, that's what you wanna focus on in your storytelling. And every person that is on your team related to a project should have their own story that's personal to them. Um, you know, what is important to me and projects in my neighborhood is not going to be important to my neighbor two doors down. Um, and so just making it really personal is so, so important. <clears throat> and so the basics are just what? What is the project? Who's involved in it? and when and where is it gonna take place? And these turns out are also things that grant makers also like to know. And so as you practice this, this will help you um, if you haven't made the leap into grant writing, this helps with those specifics because then you can do that cutting and pasting into applications um, or it just helps you get stronger in um, the, making the case. Um, and that proof of concept that you need to do sometimes with grantors and foundations. <clears throat> All right. Um, the other thing um, that I always tell people to do, have a prospect chart. Write down every single person that you can think of that you're gonna ask for money. Think about how you're gonna ask them and how much you're going to ask them for because that will help you break down your goals into manageable work because it, it can be daunting to look at <coughs> excuse me a 50 25 10 five thousand dollar goal but if you break it down into chunks of 250 150 35 and so forth 
you get a clear picture of what your work is going to look like. Um, and that's really part of my job is to help you make things easier, to make them less daunting, to fit this into your already busy schedule so that it is something that keeps you energized and excited about the work that you're doing in your community and doesn't become a burden. But I am also always here to get you through those roadblocks, to be your encourager, to be your cheerleader. So <clears throat> this is just some data on what you can expect through the method that you ask people to give. So you can see that the highest yes is in person. 50% of the people that you ask to give in person will say yes. Um, <clears throat> one thing that is not in this chart is text messaging. Um, and texting is about as um, fruitful as um, over the phone. So about 25% of people that you ask either on a phone conversation or through a text message will give as well. And then um, <clears throat> you can see again that um, the, the return for Facebook and Twitter is really, really low. Um, and so you, your sweet spot really is those um, face-to-face or even screen-to-screen. -screen. Um, that's one of the beautiful things that we've learned during COVID is that we can do work in this way too. Um, and that also might be a great way to practice before you do this in-person masks. And so that's really where you wanna spend the bulk of your time. Um, and then this chart, how, has you think about, okay, the number of people you've got to ask at each level and what you can expect based on the percentage that we have seen. <clears throat> um, the other thing the prospect chart does is it like really helps you stretch. Um, without doing it, you might just have like a group of 10 people that you feel comfortable asking. Um, but doing that chart and just writing down every single person you know, having every person on your team write that down that just widens your circle of support. Um, it also helps you get strategic. I am a super strategic person. I like to think in that way. I like to win. Um, and so building that out kind of gives you this roadmap of how to get there. And you, and you can see what's working, what isn't working and spend more time on the things that are working and like and tweak and really work that out together with your team. And it also makes sure like, you know, people, if they're not asked, they're not going to give to you. And so you're not going to leave money on the table because you're asking everybody that you know. <clears throat> and <clears throat> when people say no, it doesn't mean, um, no, I think you're a terrible person. It means no right now. And so they could be a person that could share with five other people what work you're doing. They might be able to volunteer with your work um, or they might be able to come around later and support your work. Um, but if you don't ask, you'll never know. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so other stigmas, you know, that you might, you might be telling yourself in your head, stories that you're telling yourself in your head. Like, My friends don't have a lot of money. I just don't know if they're going to give. Small amounts add up. Um, you might say to yourself, I'm not a 501c3. I can't do this. And part of why IOB exists is because we know that not everybody wants to form a nonprofit, but neighbors have great ideas. And so we offer what's called fiscal sponsorship. Um, I don't know if you all saw the story of the teacher in West Virginia who raised like $40,000 for meals for their students during the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, turns out the IRS thought that treated that as personal income. And so that teacher was personally responsible for taxes on $40,000. Um, and so that's why one of the reasons um, IOB offers fiscal sponsorship is that we don't want any community leader to end up in that situation. And so, we are a nonprofit, and so we're able to offer fiscal sponsorship at a low fee so that you don't have to be personally responsible for those funds on your taxes, and you're really able to focus on doing that good work in your community. 
Um, and we're continuously working on um, improving that. Um, one great thing that we have right now is that we are offering fiscal sponsorship for grants. Um, we're able, um, we've improved that in the past. It was, if we accepted a grant for you, um, for example, of $1,000, we required that you raised 250 on the IOB platform. We've gotten rid of those fundraising requirements. Um, and so we are able to accept grants for individuals or unincorporated groups uh, because and offer our 501c3 status to you so that you're not personally responsible for those funds on your individual taxes. Um, and then we also um, are able to, to like track your donations for you and people get an automatic um, thank you from IOB that can serve for their tax records. And you have all of that to thank them as well. Um, and then you might also think like, I have no idea where to start. That's where I come in. I can help you get started. I can help you figure that out, create a roadmap with you and just take all of the goodness that you have in your brain related to the work that you're doing in your community and map it out and figure out how to get you to success. <clears throat> um, and just again, um, when you think about making that ask, um, talking about what your project is, why it matters to you and asking people for a specific amount. What, why, and how much? What, why, and how much? I can't say that enough. And the better that you get at that, um, the more likely you're gonna see yeses. And when you're talking to people, you'll usually get a sense of what to lead with by the questions that your, um, your neighbors, your potential supporters are asking you. They might be asking you questions about the work and that means they're a story person. They wanna hear the, that why and that what of the project. You might sit down with a person who, you know, when you invite them out to coffee or to go on a walk or to have some ice cream, they might know why you're getting together with them and say, so how much do you think this is gonna cost? And that's a person who wants to hear about the money. The thing to know is that if a person starts with a story, you still have to get to the money. And if a person starts with the money, you still have to get to the story because neither piece exists separately. And when you bring them together and talk about that, that's when you're going to see um, the greatest support from a donor because you've connected those two pieces so that people see um, the work and the impact that their donation is gonna have to really grow that in your work. Um, and then this is just an example of um, an ask. So, hey, Dominique, I noticed the cars speed way too fast in our neighborhood and it's not safe for kids to bike or play. So I've started a crowdfunding campaign at IOB to install planters to slow down traffic. Could you give $25 to make the neighborhood safer for kids? So it's the why, cars are speeding too fast. The what, I'm doing, I'm gonna install planters to slow down traffic. And the how much, $25. That's it. <clears throat> um, and then the biggest things too, um, you're just offering somebody an opportunity to participate. That could be by donating, that could be by volunteering. Um, I always tell people in their storytelling or um, in my past life when I uh, worked with Girl Scouts and was working with kids, whatever uh, you want the person's excitement level to be, you need to be that much higher so that they get to the excitement level that you want them to be at. So if you're excited, people are gonna be too. Um, and it's okay for people to say no and people will say no, um, but it's more about that. It's more than building, um, than getting that money. You're also building trust. And a lot of those people that may say no, because you've come to them and showed that you trust them with this idea, you're building trust with them. Um, you're validating your work. You're sharing the work. You're being transparent in the community that the work is going to happen. And that is so important just as much as money. And that's why we say that we are crowd resourcing, not just crowdfunding, because the folks in your neighborhood, even if they don't donate,
their mouths and what they tell other people are a megaphone for your work. And that celebrity in the neighborhood, that grandma, that auntie, um, that school teacher, if they've heard what you're doing and they're able to tell other people, that has ripple effects and um, really builds that web of community support, that web of trust and helps your work be more successful, more sustainable, and builds that ownership of the people in the neighborhoods that you're working in. <clears throat> All right, and we talked about that already. All right, I'm gonna... um, this is a really um, cool project, the Hamp Line. They um, took abandoned railroad track and turned it into a bike lane and, um, Sometimes you have to like break down your goal to the ridiculous or to an amount that makes sense in people's heads. Because to most people, $70,000 makes no sense in their head. But if you say, hey, $55 is gonna pay for one foot of new trail, that makes sense to people. And then that also, again, brings them into the project and they can go and look and say, oh, that foot of bike trail, my $55 built that. And so it also builds that community pride too. Um, we saw, we have seen that over throughout the city with a lot of paint by um, number murals. East Westwood just did a mural um, along Baltimore Avenue leading up to Roll Hill Elementary. And they had 75 neighbors come paint that mural. And the project leaders uh, said that it's only been three weeks since they painted the mural and they say every time that cars turn on that street or neighbors are walking by, somebody is pointing and say, saying, I painted that part. That's community ownership, that's community pride. And those are the other things a lot of times that you are through a donation, through getting people involved, that you're building with people. Um, also like make them fun. Um, they don't have to be business-like. Um, you're, you're probably a fun person. Your project is fun. It should reflect that. Like bring people into the work, give them a connection. You could also make it a competition among your team members um, who can raise the most. Um, you know, maybe that person gets um, a homemade pie from somebody else on the team or bragging rights or some kind of crazy trophy. Um, and um, also make sure you celebrate. You're doing, you are doing work. And when you hit your goal, celebrating that with your team, celebrating it with your community, bringing people together, letting them know that they were a part of the success. Um, again, like here's another example about asking people in person and what it can look like. It's really conversational um, and it, um, you're, you know, you're telling people what's been going on in your life, what you're working on, um, what something looks like, what it will look like. And then again, that how much piece. So the why, what, how much. <clears throat> and then also, if you're asking over email, make sure that you are um, including a link for how people can give at least three times. Um, I know, sometimes I get to the end of the email and I'm like, wait, where's the button or where's the link? And then I've got to scroll back up. So the more that you can offer that, the easier it is for people to give. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second because I know that that was a lot. So I just wanna pause and see if there are any questions from the group. Awesome. I know I'm not that good, but I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. Back. Oh, wrong screen. Okay. Right. 
So I'm gonna give each of you just a couple minutes. Think about, you might already have a project in mind that you're already working on. Um, I want you all to take just five minutes to um, develop your, think about your why. Why does that project matter? What will people see when that project is completed? And how much are you gonna ask somebody for? So this is a great way to kind of practice a three sentence, shouldn't be elaborate, three or four sentences, take about five minutes to write that down. And you can feel free to post that in the chat or if you feel comfortable, uh, you can also share that with your voice. And I'll put um, that in the chat as well. And then um, Angela and Rachel are asking me for my contact info, so I will also put that in there as well. Right. And Leslie, thank you for sharing all of this great information thus far. I'm not sure how much content you have left in the back of your presentation, but I want to give you a time check that you have about 14 minutes left. All right, we'll give everybody like just one more minute. Remember, you can type that in the chat, or if you're comfortable, you can share that with your voice in a minute.
All right. <clears throat> Hopefully that got your juices flowing and helped you think about the work that you're doing and how you can share that either with supporters or as you prepare to uh, amplify your work and uh, bring in more resources through a grant. Um, I don't see anything in the chat, but if anybody would like to share with their voice what they wrote, that would be amazing. Ooh, Angela Pickett has just posted in the chat. Um, she said her project is a basketball game between community and police officers to bridge the gap between the police and the community. And her goal is $1,500. Um, and Angela, feel free to put this in the chat. Um, if you're thinking about maybe your neighbor next door that you're asking to donate, how would you ask them to, to donate or support? All right, and while Angela's maybe typing that, is there anybody that would wanna share what they worked on with their voice? Yes, thank you again for being here this evening. Um, our organization, my kids, we work with children that are experiencing homelessness in Cincinnati Public School and Cincinnati area. And we had thought an idea when we just had our last board meeting of starting a community garden, working with Lighthouse. I meet with um, Jordan next week so that we can uh, get a location with that. And with that involved, it'll help the students or the, the children that are experiencing homelessness to kind of work on a project because food is a necessity and we find it out in a lot of our communities, it's just, you know, fresh vegetables just are not there. So with that in mind, um, engaging the students and letting them have a project so that they can work and interact with each other. And we're looking at least for $2,500 that we would need to get that started with the feed, the soil, and just everything that we would need all together. For that. I'm excited about it. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. and you know, what I heard there is food insecurity for students who are unhomed is a big issue. You want to connect kids to uh, fresh food, but also get them to understand where food comes from. And you're building some community partnerships and the total project is 2,500. And you even talked about, you even started to talk about your budget a little bit. So those wheels are turning and just, you know, thinking, how, how do you uh, tell that compelling story even more? But I'm excited. I'm ready. Um, yeah. And um, there are, there was a neighbor um, in Evanston that fundraised for a community, two neighbors in Evanston. One fundraised for a community garden, um, similar to what you're speaking of. And then another group of neighbors um, did a project to build a community orchard in a vacant lot. Um, <clears throat> that would just be open to neighbors to come and, you know, pick pears, pick apples as they wanted to. Um, and uh, Lower Price Hill is doing some really good work around food sovereignty and um, addressing food security too. So if I can be helpful in any way in um, connecting you with those, those neighbors, I'm happy to. I look forward to it. Thank you. All right, and then Mia posted in the chat that she is hoping to establish a new computer science certificate certification education program in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, and that this would be based upon the continuing project growth in population and career and economic development in that area. And she's hoping for $60,000 to make this project a reality. Uh, so, so Mia, when you think about uh, that, what would be kind of an entry level number that you might ask a neighbor for? Yes. Hi, Leslie. Um, I think the ask will probably be um, $50 if it's for my neighbors. I would ask something too steep. But then I would um, be looking for like grants if I can secure a physical sponsor. But I think for neighbors, it'll probably be just $50. Awesome. That's great. Very cool. That's awesome. All right. Um, 
we have just a little bit of time left and I don't have too much more to talk about officially, but I'm also happy to, um, after I go through my last few slides, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have or share specifically about um, our work in Cincinnati. And if you are um, a past grantee or thinking about applying for a Black Empowerment Works grant, how IOB might be able to, to support what you are doing. So um, the last bit that I'm gonna talk about is uh, just some more specifics on if you are an individual that is applying for grants, but you're not um, a associated with a 501c3 or you're an unincorporated group, what it would look like for us to accept a grant for you. So we can accept your grants. Um, your project has to meet IOB's criteria in that it is a project that is happening in the community that you live or work and that it serves a public good um, and that you are seeking something for um, a contained period of time. So it's project specific, it's time bound. And then the other thing to know is that we have a 10% fiscal sponsorship fee. So if you receive a $1,000 grant, then $100 of that would be um, a fee that we would charge. So that's a thing to keep in mind if you write a grant um, to write in that 10% fiscal sponsorship fee so that you're able to get all of those dollars that you need. And sometimes some foundations will cover the cost of that fiscal sponsorship fee. So that's always something that you can ask for as well. It's really common, we see it a lot um, in, with some of our other work um, in our cities throughout the country. Um, so that is the last slide that I have. And then I'll also type this in the chat again, because you all have had some really great ideas um, as well, but I'm gonna type my information um, in the chat. Um, and I'm also always up for grabbing coffee or taking a walk in the park to hear more about your work and to hear about how um, IOB might be able to partner and elevate what you're doing. Um, any questions from the group or any curiosities that you have about our work here in Cincinnati? Can you share a little bit more about the, or briefly about the process to get a project onto the platform? Yeah, absolutely. So it is um, very easy uh, to, to work with us. So um, first of all, if you've got an idea that you are interested in crowdfunding for, you can go to iob.org slash idea, and that will send something to me and then I will reach out to you with an email that says, hey, Samantha, I saw that you uh, submitted an idea for a project to address uh, Black maternal health. Let's talk about it. And um, you can book time on my calendar. Usually I follow up with a link to my Calendly. You can book time on my calendar. It can be an in-person meeting. We can do it over Zoom. Um, we can even just chat over the phone if you are tired of being on screens. Totally okay with that. Um, and then from there, you um, create an account on, at iob.org to be able to build your page. Um, and the beautiful thing is that you can kind of pace yourself as you have time. So, you know, you can, you can do it for, you know, 20 minutes or so in an evening um, over a few days. It takes about an hour or so to do it. I'm actually going to show you on the back end. Um, what a project looks like. Okay. So this is a um, project that is fundraising right now on our page at iob.org, but you can see that there is, there are crank the blanks here that tell you exactly what to put in and what to write. Um, and so this section is just kind of the basics about you, um, when you need your funds by, uh, how long you want to run your campaign, things like that. And then you have a section where you talk about your project budget, 
And this does not have to be incredibly detailed. You do not have to say, I'm gonna spend this much in this month. It is very um, kind of high level. So you can see here, it's like labor, food, rent, materials and supplies, admin fees. Then this is the fun part because you get to talk about, this one's easy too, because it's just about you. Um, and if you are associated with a nonprofit, you fill that in, or if you need to use us for fiscal sponsorship, you fill that in. And then the part that should be the easiest is where you get to tell your story. Um, so you get to fill that in and just talk about what the project is, what it will do, the steps that you're gonna take and kind of a timeline so that people can see when the work is expected to happen. And then you're also able to share photos or videos as well in the extra section. And you also have the ability to ask for volunteers. And so then this does not become live until you tell me or someone at IOB that it is ready to go. Um, and so what I do before we launch it is I just look and I make simple uh, grammatical corrections and I make sure that your math is accurate. And I put in the handy dandy chart about our fees for transparency. Um, and then whatever the fees turn out to be, we add that on top of your goals. So we don't take it out. So if you're raising um, $1,000, we have a 3% platform fee. If you needed fiscal sponsorship, that's a 5% fee, unless it's for a grant, which is 10. So say you don't need fiscal sponsorship, you're associated with a 501c3, so you just have that 3% fee. So instead of it displaying as 1,000, it displays at 1,030. And then we take that 30, you get that 1,000. Um, and so this is what it would look like published. So you can see the photos from this project. You can put multiple photos in. Um, and then there's this fun little fee calculator to show people how close you are to your goal. And then this is really great. And it's a good chance for you to practice those specific asks um, where you get to tell people, okay, if you give $15, this is what you make possible. If you give $50, this is what you make possible and so on. And um, the other thing to know is we have what's called a flexible finish policy. So if you blow your goal out of the water two weeks earlier than your campaign deadline, you can end it early. Or if you need a few more weeks, we can do that too. And whatever you raise, you keep. It's not like Kickstarter where you have to hit your goal to get all of, to get any of your money. So yeah. thanks for that question, Janae. Any other questions? I know we are at time right now. Well, I am so thankful to you all and your time. I, uh, especially right before the dinner hour, thanks for being here. And my contact information, leslie, L-E-S-L-I-E at I-O-B-Y dot org is in the chat. And you can learn more about our work in Cincinnati at www.iob.org slash Cincinnati. And if you're ready to go with us, go to iob.org slash idea. Thank you so much, Leslie, for your time today and talking about IOB and all of the opportunities that are possible through the platform and in collaboration with you. Uh, and thanks everyone who was here this evening. Just to close out, we have a couple of additional community resource sessions uh, that'll operate in the same way as this one. So on the 25th, we have a session on building strong legal foundations uh, presented by a participant from the Black Lawyers Association of Cincinnati and Pro Bono Partnership, just about the legal considerations of accepting grant funds and the other structure opportunities beyond a nonprofit. And then on June 1st, we have a presentation with the Cincinnati and Hamilton County Public Library on finding grants and winning them. So again, if you would like to reach out to anyone at the United Way team, specifically from Black Empowerment Works, feel free to send us an email at black-led at uwgc.org or give us a call at 513-762-7233. We'll follow up this meeting with an email that includes the deck and Leslie's contact information, but we hope you have a great rest of your evening. Take care, y'all.